Okay, well, good morning. Thanks to those who've joined us already on our Adoption UK webinar. We're exploring um, letterbox contact and digitalizing that, bringing it into the 21st century. We've got Beverly Barnett-Jones from the Nuffield Institute, who's been doing some research about the benefits of digitalizing the contact. Um, and we've got a lovely panel of people today who are going to feed into their experiences about letterbox contacts, where it's worked, where it hasn't worked, um, and lots of pointers for us as, as adoptive parents on how to, to improve that. So I'm going to hand over to Beverly, who's going to introduce herself, um, the project. Don't worry, it is a webinar. We can't see or hear you, so don't worry about what chaos is going on in your background. And if you've got any comments, if you could put them in the chat, um, any questions, if you put them in the chat, and then I'll feed those questions back to the relevant person. Okay, so I'll feed on to Beverly. I'll um, still be here if you need me, um, but I'll, I'll let you take it from here, Beverly. That's great. So hi everybody, I'm Beth Barnett-Jones, as Joe said, and I work for the Nuffield Family Justice Observatory. Um, I work as an associate director looking at system impacts. My background is 30 years in social work, particularly working with children and families. Uh, really pleased to be here today uh, at this webinar with you all and really pleased to be with the great panel of, that we've got uh, uh, at present. Um, they will introduce themselves and give about five minutes around their experiences. So I'm not gonna to spend too much time talking because that's really, for me, the most important exchanges that will happen today. But just to kind of re reference to you that the uh, Nuffield Family Justice Observatory have had a focus on contact in the last two years, and it will actually be a long-term focus for us. And that's really been looking at research over the last 25 years around the difficulties in terms of contact across all children's experiences. And in particular, we've looked at the issue of letterbox contact as part of that review, publishing a number of reports since March 2020, looking at COVID impact on contact, digital contact, and also publishing a really important synthesis of evidence uh, involving, you know, leading researchers that some of you will be aware of, such as Beth Nill, Janet Bodie, Padmini, Ilya. And basically that, that review kind of brings together evidence which on the whole concludes that contact in all forms of permanency, including uh, adoption, is generally beneficial to the well-being of children, uh, benefits them in terms of their emotional development, their emotional identity over time. But clearly there are some uh, caveats around that. That content has to be well-planned, well-supported, has to be adaptive and has to be flexible. And that has to be over time. If that happens, the contact can be beneficial. Often what we know and the research tells us, the lived experience tells us is actually sometimes that doesn't happen. In fact, it happens in a lot of, lots of times. It's not organised, it's not planned, it's not thought through, and it's potentially harmful for all parties involved. So we're really keen to promote that best evidence in terms of planning with institutions, local authorities, adoption agencies, working with adoption agents, uh, organisations such as Adoption UK to promote that message that if it's done well, and the structures and processes are in place, it can be beneficial to the well-being of all children. Um, I've been leading on a project which is around digital, digitalizing the post-adoption uh, post, uh, contact. It's really looking at how could digital processes and digital tools bring about that uh, positive, uh, permanent connection or continued connection and adoption for children and, and families. Uh, we're going to be publishing the results of that work that we've done um, in May, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it. But the key messages that emerge is that obviously it's a complex issue. Uh, there are all sorts of questions that emerge if you move to digital systems, issues around digital poverty, access, people's concerns around security. But the most important thing that we got from this, from this work is what we know, which is if it's supported, if it's flexible, if it's facilitated, it can work to bring about that ordinary type of connection. It doesn't become something which is outside of the everyday, but becomes part of how does a young person in an adoptive context get access to knowledge and information that helps integrate their identity as they are, and where they are, with the ongoing journey of their family. And we know that that is a, a potential really powerful tool to bring about a change really, a change in how we think about letterbox, or how we think about contact. It doesn't mean it's an automatic direct lead to direct contact, but what it does do is normalise the arrangements and enable that young person and that adoptive parent and that birth parent to stay in communication, obviously set within agreements, obviously set within review processes, and obviously set within the flexibility and adaptability that we know is missing right now. 
I'm not going to spend too much time talking, really. I'm happy to be contacted about the report when we publish it. Uh, we're going to look to publish it around May and hold an event. And obviously, I will invite Adoption UK to attend. But that's enough from me, I think, because really today it's about my mm -hmm. panel colleagues, my friends, and I'm okay to call them my friends as well, because it's been a journey together of development and learning on this project. So I'm going to hand over to my lovely colleague, uh, Angela Fraser Weeks, to share with you her insights. Brilliant. Thanks, Bev. Um, I have to stick to what I've written down because otherwise we could be here till Christmas. So, Hi, I'm Angela Fraserwicks. I lost my eldest two children to adoption back in 2004, following a very long and fraught battle with my local authority. I'd asked for help and support with mental health and addiction issues, but it was the abuse I suffered at the hands of my ex-partner that ultimately led to my children being permanently removed. I then became what we call in the system a birth mum, or a much nicer way and a a way I prefer of saying it, first mum. It was the fight for letterbox contact and the subsequent letters that I would go on to exchange with my sons that led me to turn my life around and, if I'm brutally honest, saved my life. They became my motivation to live rather than simply existing. I was helped to arrange letterbox contact by a charity after adoption who sadly are no longer around and working with them led me to work with the family rights group. I'm now a trustee of FRG and a founding member of their parents panel, one of the expert panels made up of people with lived experience of the child welfare and family justice system. I've worked with them for the past 15 years trying to raise awareness of the problems facing families, especially birth families, particularly around post-adoption support and contact. I believe that we should have a duty of care to the women and wider family of those children we permanently remove to ensure that they're properly supported and that we ensure contact with the adopted child is facilitated in the best way for the child and wider family. And as Bev so rightly put it, that that arrangement is reviewed regularly to ensure it's still right for everyone Im involved. Um, we as a birth family are part of the adopted child's identity and heritage. We can be an enormous resource and our children deserve to know that they're loved and not forgotten. As I say quite often, no child ever suffered by being loved by more than one mother, father, grandmother, grandfather. Fortunately, I'm now happily married with a nine-year-old daughter who's had no local authority involvement at all. Shortly before Christmas last year, I was reunited with my eldest son, who's now 22, and we're starting to, to rebuild our relationship together. Sadly, it took him four and a half years to actually manage to get in touch with me because the contact was actually prevented by our old local authority and we are obviously having to connect virtually and digitally because of COVID and the added um, problem is that he lives on the other side of the world, he lives in Australia but we are we're finding our way through and we're building our relationship together and so that's all from me and I would now like to hand you over to Tegan who's going to introduce themselves. Hi, I went into care at two and a half years old after being taken off my dad due to drug concerns. I could not go to my mum's care as she'd be in jail when I was born, getting out just before I turned one. I spent my first five months with her before I went to live with my dad and his parents for the next 10 months. Finally, we got our own place, living there for a year. I lived with my foster parents for two years before moving to my mum's at two years old. I've had contact via yearly via yearly letterbox in October with my nana Pats and Gramps who are on my birth mum's side. Within our first year my mum's thought photos may be a nice idea so we asked our co contact coordinator which she was very up for. She allowed my grandparents to send cards with the letters yearly. My mum's always saw these letters as mine and not theirs. They would write it when I was younger as knew I couldn't but would read it to me and make sure to include anything I wanted, words, art or pictures or send any questions and when older gave me the option or they could step back if wanted. This was so crucial to me and the openness they had around me being adopted in general. It felt right and I appreciated it as I know not many are. I also over the years got two letters from my mum, one when I was nine, when I was ready, which was some basic information of her, my dad and sisters, plus a hello and sorry for not writing sooner. Then at 15, a letter we received from my grandparents held some bad health updates. My nana had experienced heart attacks and my gramps had stopped driving due to his Parkinson's. We met face to face the next summer after my GCSEs. It went so well and felt like I only had met them the week before. Also, it was a big moment for our contact coordinator as we got so lucky to have the same one for 13 years. It's finally saw me, has seen me grow up. I felt so grateful. I met my grandparents when I did. 
as I got to see them even more and got to know them even better. I sadly lost my nana Pats last year, so if we'd waited till 18, may have never got any time with her. This made me really think about the fact time does not stop. If we'd known better, could have just asked and had more control of contact, we might have done to meet them earlier, so had learnt more from her and had even more time. Also, my granddad on my dad's side passed before I got to meet him or make contact. The next year, after meeting my grandparents, I received a letter from my mum as a help and, and a catching up. She said she would be up for meeting me if I ever was. I really liked this idea. So when she was over from Ireland that summer with my two younger sisters, got to meet them also, even though we didn't really speak. Our contact coordinator left it up to us and how we did this contact. However, she offered to be there if we wanted and also said she could arrange someone to come with her in case the kids needed any looking after. We said that might be a good idea, so I said yes, but in the end, wasn't needed. They even joked they felt redundant with how well it went and how my mum dealt with everything. It felt so good to meet her and beneficial to her to hear her side and had wanted to wait face to face is easier, especially with emotions. So hadn't ignored me or anything as such. She also gave me some items from when I was a young baby, cards, pictures, and a prison possession bag. With both her and my grandparents, we have phone communication where text, phone calls, and video calls, whenever we want, either catch up or news. This has worked well and is really nice, can have more normal relationship. Also helped to get in touch with my sister who had been looking for me about five years ago and wasn't successful, there was in that bridge but my nana became that when my sister visited them she messaged saying here's her number if you want to and when ready which I did instantly we have now exchanged texts and emails which is so much easier than letters for us it's more natural it's great to get my sister back this goes on with the idea of can be good to keep family updated even if not to get the same back we learned my nana had been passing all the letters on to my mum who then passed them on to my dad sometimes now I know this may sound dodgy but I'm so grateful and happy it happened as it was a way to keep everyone informed easily so I didn't feel they missed so much. My mums were also pleased in a way. I also got contact with my dad last year in October as I, as he got a phone for the first time in a decade. My mum messaged saying this and she can pass on his number if okay. I said yes and now we are messaging daily and playing video games. <sighs> we got into our routine and have learned so much about family. I knew nothing about this time last year. We did our first call on a PS4 in case it needed something to focus on, which ended up not. But I thought this was a clever idea to do so, digital contact, especially with siblings. Once got one kind of contact, contact can be like dominoes, but once you can control, it gives chance for contact with others. I met a lot of my family at my Nana Pat's funeral, which was great in a way. Have you made connection with these people? I also have also had contact with my foster parents since I was adopted. Now this is a rarity and sometimes foster carers don't want to keep in touch with a child. Partly it's busy, I just want to move on. However, I really appreciate having contact with them. I've learned stories, but I otherwise feel I would have been lost quite easily as there's sort of things you have over a dinner table. I've also had many more memories with them and more time with this. And it's something I'm grateful to have and think it's something to think about when sourcing contact either at the beginning or later on. Making this contact with foster carers as these were people in my life at one of the worst possible times and when I needed most care and love so they were vital and who didn't who don't just go away I think even if you can't have contact with them I think something I'm always grateful is even with social workers for example I haven't had contact but I knew who they were overall it's just been one big family with a lot of love I'm now going to pass over to my colleague Scarlett when she's ready <laughs> oh just bear with me a second. Hi everyone. So this is my first time publicly speaking about my story. So if I seem a little nervous, that's why. And if my voice is a little shaker. I'm Scarlett. After an emotional fight with social services at the age of 16, my son was removed and adopted at 21 months for future risk of emotional harm due to domestic violence and mental health. I am now just a birth mother. I was granted two letters a year and my mum one as she was party to proceedings due to my age. He was thankfully adopted to the lovely lady sitting here on the panel with me today, Laura. The letters arrived and I wasn't really expecting much, but the letters were beautiful. There were pages and pages of TJ's life, what he had been doing, how his health was, what his bedroom was like, what he liked to eat. It was just extremely detailed. My first letter and even every single letter after that, obviously I struggled to write. How do you write a letter to your two year old son? There wasn't any support, um, there wasn't any help. I didn't really know how to approach this situation. I knew I wasn't allowed to put that I loved him or anything within the letters. So I found it really difficult to write. It didn't get any easier. 
But I wrote back and every six months the letters arrived. They would break me, but also make me at the same time. They give me a little bit of hope. Through our letters, I feel that we formed a relationship. And in 2019, Laura's letter asked me to meet, something which I'd asked to do before the adoption went through, but we were both told that we wasn't allowed due to certain reasons. After another battle for 12 months, trying to meet through social services and the letterbox and the local authority, she, she eventually ended up approaching me herself. So we met and we cried and we shared photos. And then she asked the question about me speaking to TJ, something which changed my life. We spoke on Skype for a while, building a relationship, and we met in October 2019. Since then, we've met on neutral ground across the country, and me and TJ actually speak weekly now online. Um, between me, my mum, Laura and Jacob, we called what we call now the crazy family, and great relationships, and plan to sustain contact. For me, Laura getting back in touch and having contact with TJ that's just more than letters has saved me more than she will ever know. And I'll pass to Laura now. Thank you very much. <clears throat> it's hard to speak after that. So um, <laughs> my name's Laura um, and I'm a single adoptive mum of two amazing little boys. And my experience with contact is really quite polarised. So obviously we have a fantastic relationship with Scarlett and I hate even to use the word contact with that relationship because we don't do contact. We have a relationship and we make memories. But obviously it hasn't always been that way. And we have developed this relationship through our letterbox. But just like most letterbox arrangements, our contact options were never reviewed. And it was clear that the local authority would have been happy for us to have continued the way we were until our son was 18. And probably would have even called that a success. And I had to put up quite a fight with the regional adop adoption agency and then the, the local authority to even get to meet Scarlett. It was phone call after phone call after email after email and it was always we're doing this we've got to refer you there we're making them do this first we need to check this database we need to do that assessment and it just took forever and we finally reached the point where we were given the green light to meet and we were on this three month waiting list for a referral with a charity when it then folded and as Scarlett said, we've been waiting well over a year since I'd first posed the question about perhaps meeting them. And I felt we'd all waited long enough. So I took matters into my own hands and I approached them directly. And as Scarlett shared, things have grown from there for the benefit of our son. In stark contrast, my younger son, through no one's fault, I would say, has no contact whatsoever with any of his birth family currently. Again, for very different reasons, I was not allowed to meet his birth mum either. But I still live in hope that one day something might change. And I actually feel really sad because I can see that due to her own needs, how she would really have benefited from moving this contact from letterbox into the 21st century um, and perhaps online. But at the moment, I write once per year and that letter goes in a file in an office somewhere and there it stays. And I find it so much harder to talk to my younger son about his birth family uh, as we have so little information. It was totally natural because, because we had these letters from Scarlett to talk to my eldest about his birth family and to weave the information that she gave us into our everyday lives. She was never not spoken of. But for my youngest, who came to live with me as a seven month old, as a little baby, so far it's sort of felt awkward because I don't feel like I know anything about these people and I just don't feel any connection with them. I'm not here this morning to say that everyone should be doing things the same way that Scarlett and I are, um, but because that's silly, no two stories are the same. But I have to say, it does feel a lot more natural and normal than my younger son, who may know nothing or nothing any nothing real or tangible about his roots and his birth family. So I'm here to urge people that if you do have a connection with your child's birth family, to really see it as a real positive and to try and make the most of it. I hand back to Bev now. I mute myself. <laughs> thank you so much, uh, all of you, such powerful uh, testimony and thank you for being, being so open today and, and bringing those perspectives. Joe, I'll go over to you um, and wonder if we've got uh, any 
any questions or any points that people would like any of the panel members to answer or myself? Well, she said some lovely compliments there about thanking people for her, yes. the power of the story after seeing things come through the chat. Yes, well done. Mm -hmm. And that comes from me and, and the members here that's coming through on the chat, feeling very privileged to hear your stories. They're such personal stories. And like I said earlier, they're ones that don't get much airtime a lot of the time, especially for first families. They often don't get a voice in the whole adoption triangle. And it's, it's mm -hmm. great to hear that today. Um, really appreciate sharing your stories. It's so helpful. This member's a single prospective adopter to listen to your experiences. And they hope that their, their future child will be able to have those relationships with first family. Um, I've got a question from my point of view. Um, I think Scarlett, you said that the, the letters were so detailed. I think as an adoptive parent, it's really hard to balance between expressing how much I love my kids and, and how I'll do anything for them without almost feeling like, I don't know if for want of a better phrase, rubbing their face in it, that you know, yeah, I, 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 could, that I could speak for a week about how great my kids are and how funny <laughs> they are and how full of life. And then I think, oh, is this going to be really painful for them to read that they're missing out on these great kids? That is a discussion that obviously me and Laura have had previously. And you know, she felt that some things that she put in the letters could have been rubbing me face in it. But you know, for me, it was nice to just know how loved he was. And yeah. that he was safe. So for her to put within the letters, you know, how much she cared for him, it it, it just made me feel a lot better knowing he was, was safe and he was looked after. So although it was very upsetting for me to read, I never looked at it like she was rubbing me face in it whatsoever. It was just nice to know that he was safe. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a hard balance to strike, I think, because yeah. you don't, you know... As, as much as you you know they are your world and you're like oh and they're so funny when they do this and you want to see how you know they get on and all this at the same time as I guess like you said it made you and it broke you at the same like, that's time that's exactly what I said yeah it, you know it did it broke me out reading them I mean sometimes I'd sit there and I would literally cry for days but at the same yeah. time like I said it, it, it made me as well yeah so I think Angela you've got a point to make as well around that I saw you I saw your response <laughs> when uh, Joe asked that question yeah yeah, yeah no I think it, it's such an important point I think two things there I mean one thing that leapt out at me when Laura was talking is where she talked about our son and I just thought because that's how my son's adoptive mum would refer to my boys and I always thought that was such a, a selfless way of trying to make me feel at ease she would always say you'd be so proud and I used to get two letters so I'd get the letter that my sons wrote who which would always lovely I loved it it would have photographs it'd be telling me things they'd done but then I'd get what I used to call the mum letter from their mum and she tell me all the stuff that as a mum is actually really important to know how their health is how they're getting on at school you know because I'd always worried about their mental health because you hear so many stories about people finding things difficult and when my son hit his teens and we started to have a real wobble around postbox contact because I had a relationship with his mum we were able to talk to one another about it and I actually backed off and said well actually if he needs a break from postbox then that's what we need to do but it was I don't think if we'd have had hadn't had that relationship, we'd have been able to to have those conversations and ensure that we were doing the right thing for him. But yeah, no, those letters, and I've always really appreciated how difficult it is for their mum to sit down and write those letters. I, you know, I've always got that for the rest of the year, she, she's just mum. Yeah. But then at that one point, she has to sit down and, and revisit things that must be difficult for her as well. And I think that because we've got to know one another, we've been able to support each other with that. And I have, I mean, I do hope now that I'm reconnected with my eldest son that at some point we may actually get to meet because I would... Mm -hmm. As Scarlett said, I'd love to be able to say thank you to her because knowing that she's loved and cared and supported my children in exactly the same way I would have wanted to do has given me peace and stability and, and yeah. was what enabled me to make all the changes I needed in my life. Yeah. It's so interesting for me to listen because part of the work we did with the uh, digital project was to bring people around into circles. So we brought first family birth parents and grandparents around a circle, we've got adopters around a circle, we've got adoption workers around a circle in this thing called a triangle. And I always think the triangle is problematic. I think the idea of the circle is, is, is quite a powerful image for me. Because what we found were the parallel stories. So birth parents talking about the difficulties of writing the first letter, where the support may be, where the struggle was. Adoptive parents saying the same thing about the letters and how to do it. 
and it raises that question around, you know, the, the support that's on offer through the process of moving through to the adoption, to the placement, and then that first one to two years. Because we know in terms of the research, that's really critical because the drop off really happens at about 18 months to two years. People just feel like, I just can't sustain this and you get this big drop off. So we have to really think about how do we create that communication? You know, how do we help and support that, those, range, those, those sets of individuals, you know, who, who love the child, you know, who love the child um, and, and are struggling to accept for the birth parent, clearly the loss, but also for the adopted parent, trying to make that bond, trying to make that connection, but at the same time, wanting to understand about the birth family, but also concerned about some kind of intrusion, you know, do I need to exclude them to really be able to make the bond? And I think what I want to do is go back to that research again to say, actually, although it's not fully conclusive, you know, it's 25 years of work by many people, but it clearly indicates the stronger the capacity of the adoptive parent to find that way and find that world of talking about that child's family, knowing that information over time, the stronger that development of that attachment is because you're bringing up that, that, that range of capacity in your parenting uh, to, to, to a space that's uh, really complex. Um, yeah. I wanted to go back to Tegan, if I could, Joe, just to ask a little question about the way you talk about the digital world and how you, you know, you use peers, you know, as a teenager, and I know you're coming into coming at your teenage years a bit now, but, you know, what was that like in terms of the messaging? Because one of the things that we picked up from our doctors was a real concern about, you know, is it secure, you know, or would it be too intrusive I've got messages? And obviously we talked about that issue of planning and preparation being critical and having a secure portal in a sense or secure app was a way that what, what we, is what we kind of examined. What's that been like for you, Tegan, in terms of using those tools and building up to that face-to-face -face, uh, potential content? Well, we only use PS4 for video, like voice call. That's all you can do. You can do messaging, but it's quite tricky if you can imagine with a controller. But it was quite a good way. Like, I think it can be secure because I use my headphones into my controller. But from what I know, you can have it on loudspeaker so the whole house can hear you. And so I think it is quite a secure way because you can use the username on PS4. Like, really, the only thing people can get to know, can know on your PS4 if you have real secure settings is your username and your profile picture, which, you know, if you want to protect your child, doesn't really say much. But I felt that was a really good way of doing it. So I think for younger kids as well, if they're trying to meet, have a voice call with a parent or a sibling, it might be a way of, well, we can go and drive around a racing track, but we can also have conversation. Yeah, and I think that really yeah. broke down the barrier. And yeah. it, I think with things like we've used WhatsApp and email, I think you can use those safely. Like you can might be able to do it on your own devices. You might be able to do it on a household like iPad or phone. So I think there's definitely ways to keep it secure because you can set up your own an email specific, specifically for contact, for example, is an idea. Or you mm -hmm. can set up a WhatsApp, but actually you can privatize your WhatsApp. There's mm -hmm. so many different ways. I think you can set up messenger accounts that are just for contact. There's so many ways that you could do it safely. Mm -hmm. I think you've just sometimes got to, I think sometimes when we use these apps, the first way they are, are they set up quite unsafe, but actually mm -hmm. there's ways to make them safe yeah, to keep yeah. you and your child safe. So I think there's definitely ways to keep secure. That, does, that definitely resonates with one of our findings, which is around that need for digital uh, savvy, you know, to enable people in both parts of the story to get that digital competency, you know, and, and, and be supported to, 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 to develop those skills and understandings around privacy, privacy settings. I mean, one of the things we looked at was the opportunity to develop a, 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 a portal or, or mobile based or web based um, app, which is something which we know a couple of uh, adoption agencies are now looking at trialing potentially uh, at the end of the year. So we're quite excited about that because obviously that will give us a, in terms of regional adoption agencies, that like regional consistency, because what we did find was in terms of support and those kind of reflections that Tegan shared was a lot of um, inconsistency, you know, across the country and what is the support, how is it operating? You heard Laura talk about some of the barriers that she found in terms of trying to get that support. So that's a question that we're working on quite a lot at the NFGR around how do we think about some of those support standards and how do we review those to bring them into the 21st century mm -hmm. around that idea of communication and connection. connection. I think we've got a couple of questions, Joe. have we? I do have a question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so this is directed to Scarlett and Angela. How honest should they be in contact letters? Their youngest 13 year old son is struggling at the moment, but they don't want to worry his first mom. So they tend to um, colour things up. 
What are your thoughts? That's really interesting. Am I okay to speak, Angela? Of course you are. Go for yeah. it. Thank you very much. So obviously I noticed this question just then. And I would always say, be honest, whether it's the good and the bad, because it's just nice to know. Like, and you, maybe even they'll be able to offer you some support or, you know, it could be down to maybe, you know, behavioural problems or mental health. They might be able to advise you and give you a bit of support in that. But it is nice to know the good and the bad. Just anything, it's nice to know. But I would always advise to be fully honest. Okay, interesting. Yeah, actually, I was going to come in and say exactly the same thing. Um, when my eldest son became a teenager he started to have real problems around identity and was really struggling with letterbox which had been previously really very positive so it came as a complete shock um his mum wrote to me and said you know this is what's happening this is how he's feeling um but don't worry i i will keep pushing for for him to write and i wrote back and said no please don't if that's not what he needs right now then i don't that's not what i want this is not about me and what I need this is about him and what he needs and um, we were able to to work together to ensure that he actually got support and that's all I was bothered about that's what I said just please get him either some counselling or just help him through this period I will be there you don't have to worry I'm not going anywhere but I didn't want a letter that was forced I wanted a letter that was written because he wanted to write that sadly what I didn't then realize is he then turned 18 and decided that actually no now's the time I really want to speak to my birth mom I've got all of these questions and he contacted the local authority but unfortunately because my youngest son wasn't yet 18 they refused to help so he spent four and a half years desperately asking the local authority to help him and getting nowhere and in the end it was his mom his mom came to him and said look we know what she does we know the organisation she works with. I'm sure there's something on the internet. And that was, and then they began and they Googled and they found me. And he was able to then go back to the local authority and say, look, I found her. I can contact her, but I don't want to do it in an unsupported way. I don't want to just completely ruin her life by just rocking up out of the blue and needed to be done by support and as it turned out we didn't actually need very much support we had a social worker sat in on two emails and then it, we went from never having seen each other for 17 years and within 48 hours we were facetiming and we now <laughs> facetime constantly and we talk with one another but we're very careful about you know he knows he has two mums there's no there's no competition it is just but going back to that question as Scarlett said honesty just be honest with us because I I want to get to know my child I don't want to get to know a version of my child that's not authentic and not real and I want to be able to help and if I, I can't do that and I can't really contribute if I don't know exactly what's happening around my child so I, I hope that answers the question and it's a two-way street isn't it we hear from um, adult adoptees who go out to meet birth family and have been told sort of a sugar-coated version of, of birth events and so it's a shock to them when they meet in reality and vice versa I think you know if you're going to meet your your children when they're 18 or 21 or whenever they're ready you want to know the ins and outs of that of their personality I suppose don't you? you don't just want to have heard about the high days and holidays you want to hear about everything that makes them up as a person can I um, jump yeah, it, just very quickly? Um, I'm obviously not a real panellist, but I've um, had the, the <laughs> benefit of working with enough ill and all these lovely people who are panellists. Um, I normally work as a journalist and I've been trying to collect case studies and stories to try and raise the profile of this issue. And it's just, I just wanted to jump in because I've spoken to quite a few people as part of that. And um, I actually wrote a BBC story that's gone out this morning on, on the online website about, it's all about trying to highlight contact and the issues. Oh, I read that. About another woman who, um, who again, she, she, it's basically the research shows that the contact is, it drops so regularly, it's so rarely maintained. And I think some of Beth Neal's research showed um, from one small cohort, cohort that only a third of first mothers ever write back, engage in letterbox. And I think the woman I wrote about, she had, she tried to, but she had her letter sent back because she expressed herself too much in it. And it was deemed inappropriate. 
but what she was saying the whole way through was she just wanted to know about her kids come what may what was happening what was really happening in their lives that she didn't want to know that they'd had nice ice cream on the beach and they'd been on a donkey ride and that these sort of formulaic letters that had no real content just made her totally disengaged from even wanting to open the letters and there have been a few responses just to that story this morning of people who were adopted themselves saying these formulae letters would come through and they told me nothing about my mum and I had to write them back and they told her nothing about me. So I think it's partly that's it seems the system in some areas doesn't really allow for kind of much honest exchange. Yeah, yeah. Um, but then there's, 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 these are such valid points, Georgina, such valid points. And there's a, there is an issue there around the culture of practices around adoption. Um, and, and, and then being quite stubborn, you know, in terms yeah, of them being able yeah, to move them forward. Yeah. Barla and, and Angela yeah. here saying that it can be overcome. Yes, yeah. And I, what I want to do is just, just put my hand up a little bit for some of the regional adoption agencies who are tackling this and are taking on, you know, this, 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 this uh, understanding around how can we create the connection and, the, and see the communication as a, a strength. Obviously, in the context of being appropriately supported and planned and safe, you know, because it's always got to be about that individual child's journey. And it has to be, as Angela and, and Scarlett and, and everybody today said, child centred, you know. So, although it's obviously must be beneficial for all the adults, it's, it's about how do all the adults together with the support system meet the needs of children. So, there are times, as Angela just talked about, where it wouldn't have been okay, it wasn't okay for uh, her, her son wanting to contact and she didn't want it forced, and other times, and that's this issue about the need to think about support over the lifespan into adulthood and beyond. You know, it can't just be about a, a few sessions of counselling at the beginning for a first family and an expectation that that's it and that we're going to be able to move into some space where it's going to be sustainable. People are going through all sorts of experiences in first families, uh, different experiences, but just as dramatic experiences as it is for the adoptive parent, you know, to suddenly have to become this new person because you're now a parent, your identity, your relationships or context in the world completely changes so I think for us what we're doing with the work what uh, regional adoption agents that we engage was really looking at some of those mess some of those messages you know why, why are you saying that you mustn't share delicate or emotional information when it's the most potently emotional time ever you know so it's all you know practices which may have been seen to be protective and supportive so I don't want to go at it as though I've been hypercritical <laughs> but we've got a better understanding about the identity needs of children across all permanency and in adoption more than ever. And we've got, as, we, as we're seeing, a group of people, adult adoptees and adopters recognising uh, and shared with us, God, if this had been available to me 10 years ago, Bev, we, we could have had something very different here because it's 10 years later that we're chasing information about family. Because suddenly my, my child has all these questions I can't answer. So it is about building Did trust. I... It is about building trust and confidence, isn't it, Angela? Yeah. yeah no no I was just going to say I just I, I'd seen a, a question and I just wanted to address it and it's around the issue of of risk and when contact isn't in the best interests of the child mm -hmm. and I think that mm -hmm. goes back to what we were talking about earlier about the importance of making sure that that contact plan is written specifically for that child and tailored yeah. to that child because yeah. in my case my youngest son's birth father having any kind of contact with him would not have been a safe that's avenue honest. to follow and it wasn't allowed and it was very important to me that it was explained why so all of that information was provided to the post box coordinator so that she was then able to field any questions if they came from the adopters and also able to stand as a barrier between my ex-partner and my son and that's not saying that I mean, my ex-partner's now dead but that, that's it's not saying that things can't change and things can't be revisited. But I think mm. it is really very important that we also understand that there are quite frequently adults in a child's life that it's actually not safe for them to have contact with and that that mm. should form part of that contact plan. Yeah, but that yeah. child shouldn't simply be told, you can't speak, that's, that's not safe, that's not for you. I think that that child needs to be supported to understand why that's not safe and the mm -hmm. risks involved so that when they become mm -hmm. an adult because if we just say to a child you can't have any contact with that person when that child becomes an adult there's a very real risk that that child mm -hmm. is just going to go and seek out that adult because they haven't been told all the information so i think it's yeah, about and we know empowering that, and we know that child and young person 
Yeah, and we know what children do. They create stories, don't they? And they create ideas about what they think. And they can create an idealization, which is a shock when you actually do go out there on your own without that supported context and sometimes may really difficult circumstances. But they're not always difficult circumstances as well. Sometimes people have got through that recovery road and there's an issue there about what the loss, the loss that's uh, that what's been lost and what can be recovered. I just want to just go back to, I think it was Tara sent a message about working at a regional adoption agency and wanted to know a little bit about the project. What I can do, Tara, is if you could send me via Joe your contact details, your professional contact details, I'd have a direct conversation with you a little bit about that, if that's okay with you. Um, happy to do that. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna I was gonna hook you to it because that sounds like a great project. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, we've got another um, member. As an adoptive parent, I don't know what birth parents are told, even though writing back might be very hard, especially if they're depressed or having other issues. Are they advised, sorry, are they advised it may be best for the child? We should all be trying to put the child first that this contact be maintained as per the agreement. They're concerned <laughs> that they won't get any responses and this will be difficult for their daughter. That's a real big issue, isn't it? And I think, did, mm. did, did you say it was only a third um, engagement? Yeah, contact and yeah, and yeah. It's really yeah, tricky. What we recognise is it's, it's really tricky because we've got to think about the context of, you can have an agreement, you can sign a document, you can say yes, but if you think about the process of the experience of loss and separation, which is what we all understand, people are in a, in a, in a bit of a daze, you know, and it's very hard. Uh, to understand what's happening and understand the experience in them. I can, I can say that from a professional perspective, having been involved in, in uh, you know, making plans that involve adoption and working very intensely with birth parents around that. So I remember that as a professional. And there are other people here that can talk much more closely to it. The critical thing for me is what the system does in terms of the support. Because initially you can get an offer support, but you're not ready to receive that yet because you're carrying you know, a lot of pain. It's that re-entry point for us that we picked up in our work that when you come back maybe a year later, or two years later and say, I wasn't able to deal with it then, but I really want to make a reconnection. You hit a real barrier and it's really difficult to find that reconnection space because the idea is that, you know, well, this is an agreement. If you haven't done it, what do you want us to do about it? Because there isn't a sort of statutory obligation in the sense to do much more about it. But there's a moral imperative, isn't there? There's a moral imperative, you know, to do something about it. And so if you recognise that people drop off early, the point at which you offer support and the openness of being reflexive and responsive is what we're working around because it's like well actually reality is people go on an undulating journey don't they just as the child's growth is an undulating journey so there will be points where birth family or first family are saying yeah you know we're ready to do this and we can do this that and how do we offer that support and you know great agencies like PAC and so forth do that really rounded work the after adoption program as Andrew referred to which is actually now being bought by Birmingham Children's Trust I must say it is alive but it's with Birmingham Children's Trust as a model uh, you know have that flexibility when you can come and ask for the help and it doesn't just mean a short offer and go away because that's not the experience is it but it's also about the nature of some of the birth families because a lot of the women I've met you know I've got some learning difficulties and learning disabilities and find the letter concept quite difficult without support quite practically just being helped to write the letter and supported to write the letter and understand the rules so that's why the digital was quite attractive to a lot of the families we spoke to because it was like, well, I could just send an emoji or a little happy face or I could just send, I'm OK, it's lovely to hear. And the fact that that adoptive parent knows it's been received and read is a really important part of it. Because on the other side, we heard from adopters, we just don't know if the letter's ever read if we don't hear back. No, so and that was a question I was going to ask. Some of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. you know, like on WhatsApp, you get the, the blue tick. It, you know, would it be, I, yeah. I, I hope that my letters are getting to their destination, but... Equally, they could be sitting on a, on a desk yeah, or a filing yeah, cabinet somewhere. It would be yeah. nice to know that they've been read. Um, yeah, and that's what it, simple things a digital reach. process can do is do that read receipt. You know, it can do that kind of confirmation it's been read, or it's been received or it's been delivered. Right up to you can change, you can review this. If you build the trust in relationships that are possible, you can review it in that way. And it may well be that in the end you move to direct, direct face to face, which we know is probably the strongest form of kind of communication but it's not a requirement you know it's not about imposing a position on families each family I think as Andrew was saying each child is their own story isn't it their own journey what they need at that time are those things which we picked up around the current letterbox you know we don't know if it ever gets there it's former leg it's only twice a year it doesn't give me an opportunity to really express something I would like to share right now so if there's something that's really wanted to be shared and how you receive that, if it's in a format that's downloadable and receivable and you can, you know, log in and retrieve it and maybe it doesn't come through a WhatsApp message. But if you choose that you want to use those forms, 
you can see what Tegan is saying. It's possible to use those other forms as well if you're ready. But it has to be, I think, always around what, where's the support and where's the context of that support. Because it is a journey, isn't it? It's another journey you're going on when you're moving away from the formal aid and from the kind of cut and paste. And I'm not being pejorative. The family president of the family division used that term of cut and paste twice a year. Can every child be the same child with the same needs that all they ever get is a twice a year letter? It's not, is it specific to the child when the plan has been made? But that's got to be in the context of the hair, which may be limited, mm -hmm. but you've got to think about that developmental journey and that needs to be adaptive. And because it's not a reviewing system, it's not like a looked after child situation in the care system. How do we think about building a review culture with an adoption agency? And part of digital can help that by saying, would you like to review <laughs> your arrangement? Here's a message. Do you want to review your arrangement? Do you want I us think... to support you to review that arrangement? Go on, Angela. Can I, <laughs> yeah. can I... I'm doing that again? Sorry, Tegan, did you want to come in? You can go first if you want. I don't mind. No, go on. You go first. I've had uh, quite a lot. It's just a point. No, it's the point from um, earlier. So with, first of all, about birth parents and if they should know if there's bad or good. With my dad recently, I've had WhatsApp and all that with him. And there's been days I've been having bad times. I've had arguments with my parents. You know, I'm just a bit upset. And I worry about telling him as an adoptive child. You know, I worry about telling him that because it's like, does he need to know that? Because I know he's going through a lot, even just regaining contact with me. So I worry. And he's like, don't be silly. Tell me anything and everything. I'm your parent. And he was like, it's not a parent's job to pick and choose the information we get. It's not our choice to go, oh, I don't want to hear the bad stuff. He was like, I wouldn't be a good parent of yours if I said oh no don't tell me if you're upset or cry on the phone with me he's like it's my job to be there and he was like you know when I was young when I was younger and he was a single parent it was like well if you were hitting your head against the ground I couldn't just go oh, well I'm not dealing with that because that's not the sort of parent I want to be so I think that's so crucial and I think in letters in the past I've worried and my mum's have but my personal views as a child I would want my birth parents to know good or bad I would want them to be reassured that you know I'm I am going to get support and I'm doing well but I am going for a tricky patch because I feel like actually I want them to know the full honest truth of what's going on in my life I don't want to hear that everything's rainbows and I think that's the reality of for me contact about the reality of the child it's not about sugarcoating things because that's not the situation you're in and next with risk I think it's so understood understandable that yes there are sadly stories with risk there are stories where there's been kidnapping risks and all that and that is a tough reality but I think something we learn as adopter adoptees is we're trying to reduce everyone going oh every adoption has risks because every story is different and it's so constant that every adoption story seems to have a risk currently and everyone gets told oh you can only do letterbots because you could be kidnapped if you did face to face so it's that message of we're trying to say actually not every story is a risk because I think currently what we're experiencing is we've been told every story is a risk when actually it's like why and so I think we need it's about managing those risks and actually telling us if there's risks I think we want I think as someone said here we want to be told if we're not having contact oh but there is that risk and I think it's people change as I've heard stories about sometimes when adult birth parents do get that chance to see their kid they suddenly act a lot nicer they may be a druggie out on the street but as soon as they get that hour with their kid they're completely different people and I think sometimes that risk comes from them being withheld from their child they get desperate they're not sure what to do like when I was in care I think my grandparent my granddad even I think in a moment said he would kidnap me to the social services because he was in a moment he felt lost he'd kept ringing him he wasn't getting any help so I think it's about actually there is that risk but how we manage it and I think not saying I think we've all got our own personal stories. I think we all accept there are stories with risks, but actually there's also a lot of positivity and there's a lot of stories I've known that there was risk, but it was managed. I think I've had kids who, who parents would suddenly message on Facebook Messenger going, come home with us. And actually it turns out they're still druggies or whatever, but actually then the adoptive child has said for parents or social workers, this has happened and actually... The birth parents have been spoken to and that risk has been lowered because of that contact. So I think it's sometimes about you need to work with a birth parent because I think risk increases when they feel so hopeless. They feel they have no other option in life. We don't have a reason to come off of drugs. They don't have reason to stop being violent. They don't have reason 
you know, to care about anything. You know, they might say that they'll kidnap or be manipulative because they don't care. They just don't feel they'll get anywhere else. And I think that is something so crucial to think about when you're thinking of risk. So powerful point, Yeah. Go on, well Joe. Yeah. Really. I mean, that's really so powerful, well Tegan, and and that's so that's that kind of reentry point stuff I'm talking about with people because people do change, people's lives do change, and people want can just continue support and help. And, you know, that idea that the, it's, uh, you know, we know that the, the construction around the forever family is a powerful one, but also there is a forever first family. They are there and existing, do you get me? And that needs to be somewhere finding a way of integrating that in terms of that young person's identity as we go on, recognising that there are some people that you're not going to promote contact with. I mean, you know, I'm being straight up there as an old social worker. I wouldn't have promoted that contact for that particular risk because it was a very clear known risk. But remember, a lot of in the last 20 years, children have gone for adoption. A lot of the families, it's been around women who have been victims of domestic abuse and domestic abuse and been in, and been in trauma, and lots of women who've got learning difficulties and where there's lots of issues around neglect. And you know, they, they, they're not representing a threat in that in that construction. So we have to be really careful about what agencies are saying and doing, and when they're recruiting adopters, adopters, and when they're doing training. You know, great agencies now have this kind of panel. You know, they have this kind of panel in their training room with adopters, you know, meeting birth family, meeting a, a young adoptee. So they get a real sense, you know, what, what, what is this journey I'm going on? Because it is, it is, and I, and I say this, and I hope people can accept this in the way, it is a sort of, you know, fantastic kind of parenting because you are taking on something quite amazing, which is you're taking on this desire and this need for you to really want to be a parent to a child knowing that this child has another family already, do you get me, and has an existence before you. You know, that's a major, major, major job, you know, and we have to be, in the context we are, we have to really respect that and understand that. But we can, we can think about how that can be strengthened for both through this idea with this contact, which may lead to a concept around the family, you know, to, you know, people talking about mums and mums and, and stuff. But if you don't even get there, you don't get to that point. We're not trying to put a ladder here, are we? We're trying to say what you can do within your context, but be confident that some of the things that you're worrying about, which may be harmful, are not really borne out by the evidence. But what we do know is the system needs to do better for all. It needs to be reflexive. It needs to be supported. And that requires some, some investment. I just want to read from you from a chat. We've had this lovely message here from somebody called Simon Armistead. He's given his name here, so I hope that's okay. Um, Excellent webinar. You're all heroes and deserve an OB each from the Queen. So there you go. <laughs> the impact that you've had uh, on our participants. I'll just add I've already got my MBE, MBE and I've already said I won't be taking any more Queen's Awards. That's enough. And that was because of my mum. I took that MBE. No more Queen's Awards. But that's that's wonderful to hear. Uh, really, really beautiful. Laura, you've got a bit quiet for us. Let's hear from you again, because I just think it's just outstanding. You know what? Your insight into both your children's experience and sharing that with us today has just been amazing for me. But you kind of speak the truth there, don't you, about the knowing and the not knowing, isn't it? And what yeah, may mean absolutely. Is, yeah, yeah. The, the difference between sort of having really strong links and practically having no links at all. It, it's, it's a very stark contrast. And on the one hand, although, you know, doing... Um, what we're doing isn't always easy in terms of you know emotions as adults um, for my for our son um, you know that's absolutely normal to him it's become his 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 normality and it's not something that is strange or unusual and he's quite happy to talk to to people about it but for my youngest I can just see how this is actually going to store up problems for him in the future um, and you know <laughs> It's, it's, it's kind of, it's hard to write letters to somebody when you don't know what they want to know, you don't know where they are in the world, you don't know um, if they're ever going to read it. And I, I always write it as if somebody is actually going to read it. But um, yeah, it's just really difficult because you kind of think, you know, one day he is going to grow up and he is going to want to know all these, these answers to these questions. And I have no idea how we're even going to try to to fix that or to try and bring his story together because we just don't know if we're ever going to be able to find his birth family. Um, I hope that we can, but it, the circumstances surrounding his adoption mean that it's going to be pretty difficult. So yeah, tricky well, one to manage such, for you. Such, 
Something yeah. straight for you there. there like, you remind me of the the issue of the life story being the story, isn't it? That it continues as life story. You know, we need to remember that yes. context of what's happening early on. Yeah. In a sense, sets and, and I feel I, I also really yeah. feel for his his birth family as well because they're not going to have stopped thinking about him. Mm. That love for them is, you know, for him is still going to be there, but they just won't have, you know, they don't even know if he's okay. And that, that breaks my heart. It really does because I just, I, I can't imagine how that must feel for them. And just because of the difference between, you know, these two relationships with these families, um, you couldn't, you couldn't get more different really. So, mm. yeah. Angela, did you have your hand up? Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, no, no, I was just going to say, I think everything that we've spoken about today really highlights the need for proper post-adoption support. You know, I had, when I, my children first left, I had nothing and no one. And through after adoption, we managed to get letterbox. But then I had a postbox coordinator who was at the end of the telephone. She was able to advise what could go in letters, what couldn't go in letters. Nothing was too much of a problem for her. And her, in her mind, all she was ever working towards was reunification because she saw me as the person that I was and could see what the potential that I could offer to my children and actually it wasn't until she retired and was replaced with what I'm assuming was just a standard postbox coordinator that I suddenly realized just how appallingly bad the support was for everybody else and I think that the one thing that across the board I'm hearing from everyone is that if we all had someone who was really involved with us as a family, Laura, someone, a postbox coordinator working with that birth family to find out why they're not engaging. Is it because the letters are too traumatizing, helping them with that so that they can feed that back to you so that something different can be done. Everybody, we're all saying the same thing that we're all trying to navigate our own way through a system when actually if there was somebody there who was doing a really good job at supporting all of us that a lot of these issues could be dealt with for the benefit of everybody concerned so I think it does it goes back to that national a certain level of support that we can all expect and I think we could really start to see a real shift in the relationships and, and the quality of, of postbox whether it's letters or digital. Uh, just sorry, another question here. So this family are in a situation, they're trying to establish contact with the children's younger siblings who are also in adoptive placements, but their adoptive family are refusing that because they have regular letterbox contact with first family. You following me so yeah. far? Yeah. yeah. Um, the local authority said it's not possible. They don't want to upset first family, but feel like we can't let them know why the siblings can't even have a letter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyone as though, I mean, I guess, would there be potential on this app to be between birth siblings also, Beverly? Yes, because there's definitely, that's one of the things that's come out as critical is the siblings, the siblings contact, you know, yes. and how digital actually, it actually is quite a, a strong uh, profile around siblings, you know, and how that could be used in that way. So yes, it's definitely addressing first family, including, you know, which means siblings, which means yes. maybe wider kin as well as the birth parent. And also, I just want to remind, remember, although we have a big drop off in birth family contact, grandparents keep it going and they're the longer, longest lasting ones. So we need to remember that, you know, that yeah. grandparents play a critical role here in terms of the birth family. So we need to remember that that kin is there and we need to see that as just as valuable in terms of that holding that heritage and holding that story of a child's of a child's life. I'm very conscious we've got to 12 o'clock, Jo. I know, <laughs> I, I, knew this would be, I knew this would be, I knew time would fly. I can't believe it. <laughs> um, yeah, lots of questions. And if it's okay, Beverly, I will um, ping them over to you because often I get questions following a webinar. Absolutely. Um, and I'll ping them over to my panel members. I'm sure that they won't mind responding and we can bring something collective together. But um, this has been fantastic, Jo. Thank you absolutely. so much. Absolutely. I just want to echo all the comments. Last comments from my colleagues. <laughs> Scarlett? Yep. Last comments? <laughs> oh, don't, don't put me on the spot. Oh, oh, right. <laughs> didn't expect that. <laughs> All right, okay. I'll fling it to Laura, then you can come back to Scarlett. Yeah. Okay, fling it to Laura. Yeah. Any Just last comments? Myself. <laughs> so final thoughts. Yeah. Um, I guess one of the things that I would, would really ask is that local authorities don't stand as gatekeepers but actually work with 
birth families and uh, adoptive families and listen to us. And if we're asking for something, support us rather than hinder us, really. I think that's mm. one of my biggest takeaways from this whole experience has just been, you know, we're told to go down a certain route and we're told, you know, do things safely and do things like this. And when you try and do that, you just reach barriers. Mm. And actually, it would just be really helpful to have people who want to take us seriously and and give us that support when we we're asking for it. Mm -hmm. That's critical. Can I come to you now, Scarlett? Yes, you can. I do apologise <laughs> yeah. about that. I don't no problem. Do very no well problem. When I'm put on the spot, and I'm a bit panicky. Yeah. Um, so obviously, all I would say is obviously there needs a lot of reform done within the support because there is no support there, whether that be for doctors or birth families, and I feel that it does need a lot of change. Also, I would also say if you do have that connection with the birth family and it is something you want to do, then please do it because it really honestly made a difference in my life. I don't feel like when Laura got in contact with me, it literally changed my life for the better. So, uh, you know, my life wasn't going very well at all. And in the past two years, I've completely transformed my life and changed that around. And that is down to this contact that I do have with Laura, even if it wasn't face to face and it was made more digital. I imagine that it would have changed my life in exactly the same way as it has been face to face. So I would always push for adopters to obviously do that if that's something that you want to do and don't be scared of doing it. Thank you. I think one of my main points is be independent because I think as we've come to find out on this panel, social workers sometimes in right or wrong can be quite controlling of contact, the kind of contact you have. But if you know what's right for you and your child and your family, do it. You know, they might say, oh, you can only have letterbox. But actually, if you think digital, if you think face to face is better, do it. There is nothing stopping you unless there's a legal order on it. You're the ones in control. You're that child's parent and you have that right and do not hold back. Because I think a lot of the time you're advised to wait till the child's older. That child has so much going on when they're older that it's actually worse off. And I think also don't just rely on birth parents. I think birth family, because I think they sometimes can be a key. Because I think sometimes I found with my own stories, actually my birth grandparents having contact with them meant actually my mum felt more confident because she had that parental support herself. And I think sometimes just understanding birth parents are going through the toughest time of their life. I think don't listen to people who go, oh, they chose to have this or they went down the wrong path or they made the stupid decisions because actually sometimes they didn't get the support that meant they ended up in the situation they are. So actually give them a chance. Thank you, Tegan. And finally, Angela. <laughs> I don't really have a huge amount to add after all of that. I think everything yeah. that has been said that needs to be said, I think my key points are around the honesty between birth families and adoptive families. I think the more we start speaking out in events like this about the complexities and about how it's possible to manage things, we may start to see change. But I think one of the biggest things that I, I really want to see moving forward and something that I'm starting to work on now is people like us in this environment being part of training for adopters, training for social workers. So they get to hear our stories. They get to hear the reality. So it's not just a textbook. It's not just saying, well, it's black or it's white, really. And so the adopters and birth parents are prepared, properly prepared for what is to come and how it can be managed rather than waiting until the, the child has been placed and everyone's then suddenly in a mess trying to work out how to move forward. So I think it would be that. I think we need to be looking, really looking into to really good training and support around everybody that's involved. Absolutely. That's fantastic. Jo, we're going to say goodbye to you. I'm so grateful. I just members. want to say thank you for your bravery and your honesty. And it's just been really inspiring. And I know the members have felt the same way too. So it's absolutely thank, lovely to meet all of you. Yeah. And thank, and all, your, your thank all your members for their wonderful comments and great questions. We, I've really appreciated it. I know everybody has. That's thanks great. Thank you so much, guys. And the best of luck going forward with everything. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.